Okay, is it recording? Yes, it is. Okay, all right, thank you. So the session will start now. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us in this Open Security Summit training session. We, um, we are joined by um, Demi and Dov, and uh, we will have a session um, regarding introduction to Cyber and Privacy Risk Management 101. So with regard to this, I'm going to lay down the summit rules or expectations. So we expect everybody to participate in the discussions. If you have any questions, please don't be shy. Reach out, um, inquire, because um, we care deeply about this session and we want you to care deeply also of what the uh, organizer is uh, imparting and telling us. And with regard to this session, we expect mutual respect for each other and we want you to challenge directly and be solution focused then so sessions will be video recorded sometimes live streamed as well but then today it's just a video recording but later it's going to be shared on social media for example like our youtube channel twitter account and linkedin account and so, if you don't want to be identified, please take personal precautions, such as not activating your video or using NA as your name during the session. And everything created at the summit is released under a CCR and open source license. So, we are, we are all here to collaborate on topics we have chosen as a community. No one should be discriminated or harassed based on the based on your race gender age religion or based on your appearance or being an experience or anything else and so we are all expected to preserve a certain level of professionalism and respect and if you feel any kind of abusive behavior against yourself or anyone else during the summit please Report to one of the organizers as soon as you can, or you can report it to me so that it can be handled and prevented from future occurrence. Our hashtag for today is hashtag OSS2020. And if you're not invited to our Slack channel yet, please check on the chat because I'm going to send it to you, all right? Okay, so let's welcome our organizer for today, Ben, Ari, and Dove Goldman. Hello. Okay, I'll be sharing the screen one sec. Cool. I presume that you can see my screen. Um. First of all, thank you everybody for joining. Uh, we'll be presenting the, the whole topic of uh, cyber and privacy risk management in general when you're taking an account, when you need to put something in place, some kind of program, and you've given the, the responsibility, trying to understand at least your external exposure uh, to any entity, to any adversary that might come in and try to understand at least how to create a process around the management of the risk. Okay, because like, again, we can talk a, a lot about like cyber gaps, uh, hacks that are being made, etc. But it's all should like rely on some kind of risk-based approach. And we'll talk mostly from our experience uh, from years in the industry of implementing these kind of like solutions. And also uh, trying to talk about the problems that might occur during the process itself and how it's done today in the market. Um, Okay, so I think we'll start with a short round of introduction, Dov. Uh, I'll start with myself and then I'll uh, give you the stage also. My name is Demi Benary, as Elon had mentioned. I'm the CTO and co-founder of uh, Panarays. Um, in the past, I was in the Israeli Air Force. Uh, there I, uh, I was served as a, a software engineer, a team leader, and then a senior engineer. Uh, there I actually developed a missile defense system. Uh, so I come from the background of engineering. 
And then I uh, also like shifted to the world of uh, maritime analytics, basically what I did with the missiles in the Israeli Air Force, I did with ships when I left the military. And, and then uh, I started also like handling the world of uh, big data security, uh, a lot of DevOps and cloud automations, etc. So this is my background in general, also doing lots of developer communities. Uh, I founded a really large uh, developer community over like uh, 60 500 people, I think, right now, uh, focused on big data, data science, DevOps, cloud, etc. Uh, and in the past, I think, like around like four, four and change years, uh, uh, we founded Panarays together with uh, other uh, founders that were together with me in the military. Um, this is all on all the background. And I'm Dove Goldman, I'm Director of Risk and Compliance at Panarays. I joined the company. Uh, one and a quarter years ago. And I am by training a software developer and I've done also network engineering. Uh, but primarily I've been a serial entrepreneur and about 10 years ago, I started working in the esoteric field then at least of third party risk. Mm -hmm. uh, and since then I've uh, designed products for a couple of companies in this space. And then very, very proud to have joined uh, my favorite company in this space, um, Panarays. We're really proud also that having you with us, Dov. Um, cool. Okay, so I think we'll start with the with the first part of the talk itself, and speak about security in general. When I'm given the responsibility, as for example, let's take the role of the CISO. Okay, and uh, we're starting to manage the whole uh, cyber risk out of it. And before we start talking about cyber risk, what cyber security? Okay. So cyber in general is basically uh, talking about the digital footprint, the digital presence of a company or any entity basically in the world and providing with a combination of cyber like security, uh, providing some kind of uh, envelope to it and the protection layer or maybe like understanding where there's not enough protection. So humoristically, we can also see like different kinds of fails of physical security that are really common today in the world. Uh, but having those kind of things, this implies like with higher multiplication layers on the cybernetic world, like in general, the digital present world of different kinds of misconfigurations and other faults that might occur when you're out there in the open web. So if we define security, a lot of times people take that as a notion of technology, right? We're trying to secure ourselves when we're digitally present in the world, but it's not only technology. Security is actually like taking action upon different kinds of security gaps that we might find. And not only that, it's not a one-off. I don't like improve my security and that's it. It's an ongoing process, okay? And you need to put different kinds of processes in place to at least understand how you can continuously improve because everything is continuously changing also. So for that, you have lots of like risk assessment methods that are being introduced to the world. Okay, so eventually we said that we need to invest some amount of effort, right, uh, in security because we said we need to take action. But it's always a matter of resources that I'm willing to actually invest and put in this kind of process versus the amount of security that I can achieve, okay? Amount, like in general, uh, um, percentage of protection, okay? And you can never achieve 100% protection. Uh, a lot of it, uh, security research always says 99.9% uh, .9 secure means 100% exposed and hackable, okay? Because it takes only like one bit, one piece to actually uh, expose yourself to uh, some kind of a hack. And eventually as a security practitioner, as a data privacy officer or different kinds of compliance managers that are uh, out there today in the market, you get an X amount of resources that you can actually invest in any program, any maybe product itself. And you need to take these kind of resources and invest that in a smart manner. And you can't spend an endless amount of money on cybersecurity because nobody will let you, okay? Even if it's your own company, you would rather actually like make money of, of other things. But again, because we're getting to the world of everybody are digital, everybody are remote, everybody are working in a different manner. We're giving away our data to lots of entities and then it poses a lot of risk on the way that we actually work and also on the business. So it makes sense to invest something there. 
Okay, so it's always a, a direct tension between these two aspects. How much resources do I put in uh, to how much like security or like what kind of security maturity I bring myself or my company to. Okay, so let's do a small experiment. So if I would like uh, right now designate you as the CISO of Panarys or a CISO of any company, and today, uh, you know, you got the responsibility. What, what are the first questions that you literally need to ask to put something in place, to put a program again? Okay, I, I would start, you know, like with what do you want me to protect? Like ask the CEO, okay? Because eventually you're protecting something. You can't just, you know, go shopping to cybersecurity products and say, I'm really secure. So I think the most evident questions would be like, what's most confidential to my company, okay? What do you think that is confidential to a business today? Data. Intellectual property. Intellectual property. Who said I data? Uh, I said data. data. Okay, cool. Yeah. Customer's data. Okay, yeah, yeah, interesting. Customer data. Okay, these are different types of data, but data is a really, really broad, broad sense. Okay, where are you holding the data? This is the other question that I will ask you, right? If you're working on an, like a, a governmental institution, it will be on-prem. Okay, all of my customer data is internal things. But what happens if you're a SaaS company, okay? Mm -hmm. And 90% of the products that you're using are SaaS products. Interesting enough. SaaS. So you, you tell me right now that you're holding the, your data, but somebody else is holding your data, okay? No. Uh, you, you know the, the context of cloud? Have you heard of it? Mm -hmm. I'm shifting to the cloud, Google Cloud, Amazon Web Services, yes. et cetera. You know what cloud US. really is? Cloud is somebody else's computer, okay? It means that somebody else is doing the, all of the heavy lifting and you just click buttons and ramp up servers, which is cool. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> but eventually you need to understand that with every shift and movement that you're doing right now uh, with your data, because data is important, I highly agree with you, you're giving the responsibility to somebody else. And this is something to, to, to note that right now, this is something also that is confidential. And I highly agree that it might be customer data. It might mm -hmm. be corporate data. Yeah. Okay, in the context of financial, etc. So mm -hmm. these things might be confidential to the company again, mm -hmm. but moving forward, uh, if it's data of all of the groceries that you're buying to your company right now, is this important? So another question would be like, can you afford to actually lose this data? Okay, if it's uh, my uh, like inventory data database, probably mm -hmm. not. Of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I would ask also, if you lost it, is it actually irreplaceable? Okay, because if you maybe, maybe if something is gone, deleted, I don't know, something like that, but you can actually come back from uh, backup uh, in a matter of minutes. Maybe it's okay, okay? And it's a risk that I'm willing to take. And again, what could cost most damage? For example, Dov, I would like to throw that question to you. Um, on the day-to-day, -day, a tool that we're using, uh, you know, like CRMs, are they important? Are, can they cause damage to the company? The CRM itself can cause damage in the sense that there's all kinds of sensitive data mm -hmm. and uh, specifically PII, uh, non-public information about customers and, and contacts. So that's huge. The other thing that could happen is that it could shut down and we couldn't do business. So it's critical. Okay, sensitive so you mentioned like system. two important things. I would add to that something that usually, and I got that from some CISOs in the industry. You know why CRM is important business-wise? Not because you can't do business. Think of it that it has actually like all of your pipeline. And mm. what happens if that data is leaked and your competitors right now know all of your like future pipeline of customers? Literally, they can kill you tomorrow, okay? They can actually approach everybody and say, you know, I, I will drop the price to 50%. That's it, okay? Literally, it will take you so much time and so much effort to actually recover from that. And of course, what might impact your reputation? Think of it, the defacement and all sorts of like uh, embarrassing things to your cybersecurity posture, if something happens, can cause large like impact on your organization because for example, if you get breached in your security company, it's kind of like weird, right? Uh, so all of these like experiments that we're doing, these are questions that are, should be asked to the board of directors 
to the uh, high ranking management of the company to try to understand at least what's your exposure and what are your most like valuable assets that you're trying to protect. Okay, and, and let's talk like practical. Okay, um, example of data assets, security assets, uh, photos, credit card details, bank accounts, per, uh, PII, like you've mentioned, okay, accounts, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, social media accounts. Think of it that a lot of the phishing uh, methods today are being done through fake accounts. Uh, primary email, and when I'm saying primary email, I'll, I'll go back because like I gave a similar talk uh, um, uh, not a long time ago. Um, how many email addresses do you have, Dov? One, two, three, four, five. Five, okay. So in general, it makes sense because you will have work email, uh, a regular email that you're using on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, a trash email or multiple trash emails, uh, some embarrassing email that you opened when you were like 15 or something like that, and you're really embarrassed to use, but you have a lot of things there. And think of it that in, in average, you'll have like three to four, right? Uh, but eventually you have some kind of like specific assets that might hold uh, important information and they're all kind of like interconnected. And eventually when we're talking about things, you will get to the intellectual property of a company, which is like super important in the context of what you're doing on a day to day. And if that actually is compromised, your business is down, okay? Or somebody will steal that and actually duplicate things. Again, important. We can talk about secret files, differently generated certificates, et cetera, password information, financial records of the company, user data, like you've mentioned, and customer data. So we have a lot of data assets that you might want to protect, but you need to prioritize that, them also. So think of it that right now we spoke about all of the data assets, but somebody will try to get that information, right? because like a malicious adversary would try to get that. So basically he will need to do some kind of like reconnaissance phase to try to understand and to, uh, I would say, reveal your attack surface to try to understand how we can actually get to these, I would say, uh, crown jewels and steal them, correct? So what are you trying to discover? Again, we spoke about the intellectual property of, uh, of a company. This is like the main goal, but how? How can I get there? So this is literally of understanding the digital footprint of a company and trying to identify the risk. You will try to uh, understand the domain, subdomains of, of a company, uh, the technologies used, uh, devices that uh, employees use, or maybe even like machines on the cloud, et cetera, like we mentioned. Emails, personas, corporate, okay? Sometimes you try to understand and classify that. And also uh, talking about social media accounts, because again, maybe I can lure you to click a link do something, do an account takeover and actually hop from an account to account to maybe even like take over your whole identity uh, in the uh, World Wide Web. Okay, so let's classify it. Eventually we have lots of data assets in your organization, okay? And assets are you and me also, okay? Because right now an adversary, an attacker can actually identify us as somebody with high privileged accounts and he can make us do things, okay, with some social engineering. So eventually you have the division between the organizational assets, uh, domains, subdomains, IP address, endpoints, user data, etc. You will have the human layer, okay, secret files, Bitcoin wallets, primary emails, PII, different kinds of personal information that I have on myself, and things that are kind of like intercombined, the intellectual property of the company that can be held by another human being other kinds of secret files that are shared, password information, financial records, bank account details, how I'm paying your paycheck, et cetera, credit card details, uh, photos, again, account information, et cetera, that might be even your corporate one because sometimes you hold multiple like social media accounts, et cetera. And why we actually need to divide those to try to understand at least the exposure, because these are the things that I might say as the CEO of the company or as the board of directors, et cetera, do have this is your responsibility. The most important thing that I see right now that poses most risk to the company should be the digital footprint of the organization, the left side. Protect all of my domains, IP addresses, and endpoints. Mm -hmm. And then you can actually emphasize what type of solutions, or at least like pinpoint to that, where to invest most of your resources, because we've all defined as a company that these are the most uh, valuable crown jewels of the company that I want to protect. Okay. 
So again, we spoke about the cloud, we spoke about different kinds of digital assets that uh, are out there in the open, but eventually it's spread around the world, right? Because nothing is local today. Okay, eventually nothing is, is, is local. Uh, even if you have a local data center, a lot of times your backups are not in your data center because you want disaster recovery, right? So we'll put that in a different place, bam. Eventually you end up on a global distribution or at least like not a local one. So identifying where are all of the assets in the world also is important. And if we go to the back, back to the world of data privacy, you know, like uh, even in the US, you had in the past uh, the safe harbor, right? You remember that? Yeah. So today when a lot of data regulations, even global ones, I would say, okay, like uh, sort of global, uh, in the European Union, you have the GDPR, right? And uh, in California, they released the CCPA. And eventually every local place actually releases its own data privacy rules, which pretty much say it's the same. Some of them are more strict, some less, okay? But eventually you end up of, at least you need to know uh, what type of data you're holding and where your data is resided at. Because sometimes you don't want, for example, uh, you, the US had defined sanctioned uh, countries and you don't want any affiliation or any processing of data in these countries. Why? Because, okay, that's it. And because of that, you need to also like identify that from the external footprint to try to understand at least where your data is held at and try to identify that on yourself. So <clears throat> physical access and social engineering. We spoke about locality of data and where you put your things at. And we spoke about data assets, right? Data assets, which might be also like human beings. So eventually, I, I just want to show you a video. I really hope this will work and you can hear that. Just let me know if you can hear. No, we don't hear it, Demi. Y you don't hear that? No, but no. It, it's okay that, 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 that we can read the subtitles. No, 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 it's lame if you can't hear that. <laughs> One second. I'm really thinking maybe I'll open up the YouTube and you will be able to actually yeah, hear. Yeah, and it'll work, yeah. Uh, That's the difference between st uh, standing on stage and like showing something. Can you hear that? Nay? Nay. No. Uh, that's a shame. Okay, you know what? I'll unplug the... It will give you the sense. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so let's see if you can hear. You can hear now? Yes, yes. now we hear it. Two of the world's best hackers to try to hack me and show me where my vulnerabilities are. And now I'm going to meet them in Las Vegas for DEF CON, the biggest hacker convention of the year. They're going to hack me using social engineering, which is essentially hacking without any code. They just use a phone and a... <laughs> I love that video, Demi. It's a classic. I've seen it many times and I, <laughs> I'll watch it over and over again. Yeah, great. So, so in general, it gives you the, the, the at least understanding. How easy is that? Once you have a bit of information about something in the context of personal information, that's it. It only takes a, a certain amount of effort. It might take a lot of money, a lot of time, but eventually you'll get there. And because of that, we need a lot of like compensating controls, I would say, to at least understand how we can protect ourselves. Okay, and we'll speak a bit about the different kinds of abilities that we can at least introduce to our company to protect ourselves better. So let's talk about tools that do reconnaissance, right? Because right now I've showed you kind of like a ridiculous way of doing social engineering and getting access to a person's information. A very effective way. Yeah, of course, the most effective one, by the way. I have like, it's a shame that uh, yesterday's talk uh, with Alad, he didn't actually just like start talking about all of the other uh, social engineering abilities that he'd done, like uh, the awareness training that he did to all of the employees in the company. He literally sent us to shops around uh, the, the office uh, to gather information from the, the, the salespeople in the shops uh, about their personal life. And you, you couldn't like literally ask that. You needed like to, to do that with a story. So it's kind of an interesting way to, to do awareness training on social engineering by doing that by yourself. So 
we can speak about open source intelligence. Uh, probably you heard of Shodan, right? All of the exposed services and open things uh, out uh, to the world. And you can search that by IP addresses, by domains, by different kinds of uh, characteristics and uh, also like features that you can search upon and uh, to see different kinds of exploits that are out there also. So you can identify different, like even casino cameras that are open to the world, okay? On even ho household cameras, etc. Uh, different kinds of open source intelligence, trying to understand at least geolocations uh, like uh, census, uh, hosted websites, different kinds of uh, scans that you can actually grab out of there, etc. cetera. Uh, Maltigo, uh, that is basically a tool that you can lo add lots of plugins and do open source intelligence through different kinds of data sources. And you can even like develop different kinds of plugins if you have something in your domain that you can add and enrich all of these things and basically build a map of any company that you would like to, or company or person or like any entity in the world that you would like to do a reconnaissance on. Uh, build an actual like dependency graph on it and uh, create some kind of correlation between all of the assets, et cetera. Um, have you heard of Have I Been Pawned and different kinds of uh, breach databases, right? Uh, if we spoke about identities and credentials and maybe like uh, accounts, uh, all of these are being hacked on a daily basis, of course. <laughs> so here you can actually identify if your email address had been breached on a certain, uh, like really updated uh, amount of uh, data breaches that they hold. So we spoke about different kinds of reconnaissance methods and how we can actually map the organization in the hacker's view. But you can do the same exercise basically on yourself, okay? Like uh, maybe even like uh, taking the role of the red team, okay? And trying to understand at least like what kind of vulnerabilities and what kind of exposure your company has. But you need to understand like what type of things you need to protect against. And when we speak about different kinds of malware, uh, microviruses, uh, stealth viruses, different kinds of root kits to the firmware, uh, remote access toolkits, uh, different kinds of worms, keyloggers, Trojan horses, uh, ransomware attacks, something in the context of drive-by attacks, etc. And we showed also like the phishing uh, example and uh, phishing, regular like email ad, um, emails that are being sent and you basically click on a link and that's it, game over. Uh, and SMS phishing also. But these are like all abilities and buzzwords, but eventually we're trying to get to some specific asset, okay? And again, we've kind of identified that human beings are assets today also because employees of a company or maybe like individuals also that I might want to hack freelancers or different kind of entities that I'm communicating with. But we need to kind of identify right now in the context of the identity, what type of things that we can do that can actually protect ourselves. So for that, we need to like define some terms. Uh, what is privacy, Dov? Privacy. It's a broad term. Mm -hmm. Privacy, first of all, is an illusion. <laughs> ah, yeah, I, I, I gave it away. Like literally when I have something by, I would say Google, that's it. They have all of my information. And if you're holding a cell phone. That's or it. Or if you're talking to, uh, to your Amazon device or you're talking to your <laughs> iPhone or anything like that, there is no privacy. Exactly. But if we define privacy in a bit like in a different manner, I can define it uh, of answering, uh, um, I won't say a question, it will be a definition, okay? Privacy is uh, nobody knowing what you're doing, okay? Because right now, if I'm surfing in the web in an encrypted manner, nobody will know what kind of like websites I'm accessing, okay? Uh, and also they might know what kind of traffic I'm putting through that like pipeline, through that uh, hose, I would say. Uh, SSL encryption with websites, et cetera. So this is the example of doing things privately. Uh, but right now, if I want to talk about anonymity, what that means, what kind of question I might ask that will define anonymity. Who is trying to do, right? Right now, I want to do something anonymously. So maybe I will hide my identity. They will know that, like anybody in the world will know that there is some kind of activity, but they won't know who is doing that, right? Uh, hidden services, Tor, if you've heard of it, etc., and all sorts of VPN connections that I can hide my identity and nobody will know who is doing the action. And there is something in the middle, okay? It's called like pseudo-anonymity. Eventually I will have some kind of alias maybe, okay? 
uh, that I hide my real identity, but eventually I, I hide behind that. It can be also through hidden services, etc. all of the methods that I've mentioned, but not only, uh, it can be uh, something that might also get breached. And when I say breached, I mean, there are like different kinds of cross correlation attacks that I can identify that somebody is doing something. I know that this specific entity is doing that, but I can't actually resolve who the entity is. But eventually, if I gather enough features, data features on top of that entity, I might actually correlate to the real existence and that is Tov. And he's the malicious entity that is trying right now to do something or even like he's only trying to hide his identity and uh, I actually could resolve who, who is that, that person. So going again, another step forward in the context of identity, because right now we've identified that it's something that is important. Uh, right now I'm talking about uh, authentication versus authorization. It's not like the opposites, okay? It's kind of part of the workflow that we're doing right now when we're identifying that specific identity. So the first phase would be authenticating, knowing that Demi is Demi, okay? How hard might that be? <laughs> pretty hard, I would say, a lot of times, because uh, adversaries can actually steal this identity. But once you got to that identity, the authorization part is also important because it's another line of defense, I would say. Uh, you know, like least privileged uh, access. This is something that's- my that favorite is, control of in course, this. Of course, and this basically is an implementation of real authorization, okay? And because we're talking on digital presence, Digital presence means that once I'm authenticated, I'm getting a set of, uh, I would say permissions, okay? This is my authorization. And it should propagate to all of the usage, other usage that I have in the company. And if not, at least my authentication, my ID should propagate to get the formal and relevant authorization from the entity that I'm trying to access. And when we're talking about single sign-on, different kinds of uh, controls that can, you can actually implement in your company, these are things that you need to take into account when you're trying to actually protect yourself, okay? How can you actually control that? Can I say Dove can access A, B, C and can't access D? Can I actually do that technologically? Sometimes no. And because of that, you will get like direct access of all of the entities to all of the resources of a company. And what happens if Dove gets breached? Eventually somebody will overtake that, right? And he will like take access to all of the uh, things that we gave you the ability to actually see. So it's also important to mention and to try to understand your exposure in that context. So basically you see cyber risk everywhere, right? But let's at least identify the circles of, uh, I would say like protection and things that we need to take into account to actually quantify the risk. So we spoke about different kinds of data assets, right? So it's not only like cybersecurity things, it can be even on the context of legal and in the context of data privacy per se, because right now I'm trying to protect all of the relevant assets, assets that are important to my company. And when we're talking about different kinds of files, content, uh, privacy things. Uh, also, I'm maybe trying to protect the identities, right? That Dove's account won't be stolen. So these, this is like my internal parameter, I would say. And uh, caveat, I'm not really sure it's internal. And once we've actually identified that, we want to put, like you said, security controls, right? So you have a lot of technology security controls that you're gonna put in place. Uh, for example, VPN connections, different kinds of uh, encryption methods, multi-factor authentication, which is, wow, like super important. Uh, different kinds of patching mechanisms, right? Um, I don't know, like firewalls, web application firewalls, encryption, transit, and rest. Uh, you have lo lots of like, I would say knobs that you can put and close and open according to the needs that you need to like protect your perimeter. So awesome. You have like a million tools that you can invest endless amounts of money right? But eventually, what are you trying to protect against, right? What are the real threats that you're seeing from the outside? And this is another factor that you need, you need to take when you're trying to implement a program. So we spoke about vishing, phishing, spyware, adware, malware, etc., mass surveillance, uh, exploit kits, backdoors, etc. But this is another perimeter of threats. Who is actually trying to exploit those so, you know, like there are the sexy things, okay? The spies, nation states, hackers, cyber criminals, etc. But it can be really, really stupid, 
okay? It can be your ex-partner, okay? Your uh, disgruntled employee, different colleagues that annoy you or like you annoy them and eventually end up with some kind of exposure that is out there in the open and it can be even, you know, the, the stupidest way, a 15 year old that installed Kali Linux and literally like runs a brute force attack on you uh, with multiple tools through some kind of cloud automation tool. And literally he clicks like send, that's it. He doesn't even know uh, thoroughly what, what is going on, but he poses a really large risk. So eventually a multiplication of all of those uh, with all of the vulnerabilities that are found, with all of the possible threats that might be open in the world, and actually talking about the consequences of these data assets getting breached, this actually yields the real risk, okay? And eventually, we we're talking about data, okay? Consequences can be business impact, can be something in the context of data getting breached. It can be uh, uh, the seize of doing business like you've mentioned, okay? Because right now you've stopped and halted and that's it, you can't do business. And uh, your customers will actually uh, lose a lot of the trust that you've built with them because again, you didn't provide the service. So a part of the, for example, if you're talking about different kinds of cybersecurity frameworks, and there are a lot, I know that both you and I are fond of the NIST CSF framework. And basically it's protecting your perimeter, understanding the threats that kind of like enter, preventing some of them, or at least what you can identify. Uh, even if you can't prevent them, eventually like detecting even what happened in the internal perimeter, or at least like on the external footprint landscape that you have. And eventually when something will happen, because you know, it's not an if, you need to know to recover out of it. And then rinse and repeat on that again and again and again, and do that whole process in a cycle. And if we go to the practical tools of implementation there, basically you can drill down and understand what kind of tools you can put in place to actually protect from either one, okay? Uh, even the known threats and the unknown threats. So I just because- add one thing, Demi, if I yes, can. Sure. That one of the great things about the concept of NIST cybersecurity framework is it mandates that you should learn from those incidents. Mm -hmm. Every time something happens, you have new information yes. and you have exposed vulnerabilities on your side, which you can mm -hmm. now work on because you have the information about it. You didn't have it before. Yes, indeed. And of course, again, it's an ongoing process like we've mentioned. And the thing is that if, if you don't keep tabs on it, you won't be able to actually learn anything, okay? Or at least if, you, if you'll be able to learn, it won't be effective because you, you haven't implemented anything in the context of protecting yourself, et cetera. So this also matters. And because it's a cybersecurity talk, I have to say cyber, 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 really, really uh, in a silent uh, voice. And I ask you the question, what do you think that are the top three things that you need to, to actually implement to stay safe online, Don? Why don't we ask the audience? Let's see if somebody wants to yeah. chime in here. Alone, are people able to, I guess they, they can- They, they can, can unmute. Chats. They can unmute. Actually, it's not that big an audience. So let's, let's hear what no, people I see, I say. see Sandeep un unmuted himself. Yeah. Okay. Families. Get rid of smart mails or like don't open if if you know that uh, it's not related to you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, interesting. And like uh, get rid of all advertisements. Like it can be of anything in any ad blocker. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ad blockers. Awesome. Okay, interesting enough. So you you looked on the um, I would say personal exposure there, but. Uh, because like it's a you know cyber conference etc let's take something that's scientific and because google has publicized that i can say it's scientific uh most like the three most important things to stay safe online and buy CISOs, it's literally updating systems patching okay i, I always say like if patching was an easy task and it was a, a solved problem 95 percent of the cybersecurity community would be out of a job okay so thank you for everybody for not patching. Uh, but uh, using multi-factor authentication is the most important one, protecting your identity. It literally like, prevents, I think, 90% of the attacks on identities. And again, using password managers. Even if you've like done that, probably you can rotate the passwords, et cetera. So it, it, it's like, if I scope that, basically patch your programs and secure identity. 
these things will protect you from most of the things that are out in the open there, the, all of the threats to the digital presence that you have out there. So again, we spoke a lot about like, what are we trying to protect? Where our data is resided at, et cetera. And we're trying to at least do some kind of risk-based approach to that. And we try to understand what kind of threats can be imposed on our company. So how do we do that, okay? What's actually like threat modeling? So threat modeling is putting some kind of structure, okay? Structure security basis analysis to that. So the NIST CSF framework, for example, it's one kind of structure that we can actually implement. Uh, there are different frameworks, like you've mentioned, COVID, and there are like uh, the CSAs, uh, uh, CCM, cloud security matrix, uh, cloud controls matrix, I'm sorry. And uh, we need to, at least understand what fits our business use case. And once we actually understood that, adopt the framework or at least uh, take a derivative out of it to implement something that might be effective to uh, increasing our own security posture. And of course, this is literally like reviewing all of the design elements, all of the pieces of the puzzle that we have in the organization to try to protect that. Maybe try to protect the communication between different entities because we're globally spread and right now every entity uh, is autonomous. And of course, because we said that we have a limited amount of resources, we actually started from that because we don't have the endless amount of money, we need to prioritize the mitigation by risk. And we can't attack and tackle everything. I, I would ask even the audience right now, okay? Probably I'm guessing that you're doing something in the context of security or data privacy in your organization. How many people are doing that right now in, in, on the day-to-day -day with, you, with your companies? Uh, not into full-time, but uh, I look into security aspects of a uh, few projects. Mm -hmm. So you are right. So they, like literally, even in organizations of a thousand people, thousand employees, you might have a part-time outsourced or maybe even one person that is kind of in charge on that, okay? And if you think of it that all of the risks that we have right now today, uh, because everybody are digital, it's kind of weird, okay? Because even you would think that, uh, I won't say it's not important, you know, but uh, doing finance, you would have a few people, at least a few people, because you have a certain volume of tasks or things that you need to do. And what happens with security? Sometimes an engineer gets that responsibility, somebody, maybe even the VP of IT or something like that. So eventually you need to prioritize the things that you can actually tackle. Maybe outsource some of the, the abilities to actually do more security, but at least it's prioritized based approach by risk. Okay, so now we spoke about all the high level things, but literally what, are, what do we need to ask every time that we have a project like you mentioned, or at least some kind of implementation that we want to introduce to the company. And we need to ask the questions to at least understand what kind of action needs to be done. And action can be nope, nothing, okay? But why? Because we've identified, did some kind of threat modeling on that, uh, try to understand what real ri risk comes out of it, and then we accepted the risk and kind of moved forward. So the basic questions would be, what are we trying to build right now? It doesn't have to be software, okay? This is the most important thing to take, take in mind because it can be even building a new process right now with the company and trying to maybe like understand what tool we're trying to integrate right now to our internal environment. Then we need to ask what can go wrong because you know, like Murphy's Law, what can go wrong will go wrong. And eventually once we understood that, we need to understand what are we going to actually do about it, okay? And try to identify at least what action I need to take or maybe not take and take a, like a risk-based decision to not take any action. But let's, let's say we can take action upon everything. Right now, like Dovin mentioned, and this should be like continuous, we need to measure ourselves if we're literally doing a good job on doing that, right? Because right now I've installed the most uh, like updated and uh, innovative and new tech EDR, but I'm not doing prevention and I'm getting a lot of hits probably I'm not doing a good enough job. So I really need to identify and maybe like define different kinds of KPIs to see if I'm doing a good job. Okay, cool. So we spoke about different kinds of services and right now that we're globally distributed, et cetera. But as you mentioned, like we're using lots of cloud tools, 
emailing services, different kinds of uh, uh, products that we're installing and basically passing away our data to. Even if it's login credentials of users, a, a list of my employees uh, or different kinds of aspects. So third party who? And eventually a data breach in one of these suppliers uh, or like third parties that I'm working with, business partners, et cetera, can actually cause a typhoon. Okay, why? Because my data was leaked. And if you don't scope the data correctly and you don't, again, like we spoke about least privileged access. So let's call it like least privileged or like <laughs> even least amount of data or amount of features of data that we're trying to pass. I might get really hit. And we can take an example, the PNI uh, media breach. It was a small terminal like a uh, uh, footage uh, service that was installed in all of these big retailers. And why, why do I like to use this uh, example of a third party breach? Because this like breach in PNI media caused all of the largest retailers to literally halt all of their business because they can't do the, like they can't work with their registers. And think of the financial impact on that if you can't swipe the credit cards and you can't actually like sell things and this is your business, okay? So Dov, would you like to talk a bit about the, the landscape that is quite changing right now once we've expanded our perimeter because right now we spoke about data, right? And where your data is resided at. We kind of agreed that it's left your data center a long time ago and right now it's expanded to all of the services that you're using. What, what is like managing your third parties in general? So Demi, you, you, you showed a few slides ago that kind of very complex egg-shaped slide, which is your security perimeter. So this is how I think of it. I, I think of a company as a kind of a soccer ball floating in cyberspace. And you used to be able to secure that perimeter by protecting the skin of that soccer ball. And you, you built some st tough stuff behind it and you had some protection capabilities. And then when you started outsourcing, which almost everybody is doing, anybody who is, like you said, email, who has their own email server anymore? Uh, nobody. <laughs> nobody. And everything else is outsourced. I, I, when I got into the technology business, I'm not going to say how many decades ago it was. It's, it, you're going to be, you're going to know how old I am. But we were installing servers all over the place. Who has a server today? Nobody's got a server. Nobody would even think of doing it. And so it's, it's kind of a given now that it's not that soccer ball anymore. It's, a, it's, it's really like a solar system or like a galaxy, <laughs> right? It's, Inter it's, interconnected it's these, galaxy. Interconnected galaxy. So let's just say that your company is in the center, you're the sun. And then around it, you've got Aww. Mercury, Venus, you know, Earth, Mars, <laughs> and all those other planets. But they're not just floating. They got tubes between them. Yes, indeed. And your data is going through those tubes. And what happens if somebody finds one of those other soccer balls, this is a <laughs> provider, a partner, and they get a nice big pin and they shove it in and they make a hole. So now fun. your data is leaking out or, or they, you know, just take another image. Just imagine that they have a little tiny drone that they poke into that hole and the dr drone flies through your partner's soccer ball and goes through the tube. And now they're inside of you your organization. Sounds bad. <laughs> so it's terrible. It's a hard, but that's really what's happening. That's what's happening today. So yeah, you, the, this, this concept attack surface, I don't remember if you used that term Demi, but, mm -hmm. but the attack surface has gone from that little, relatively little soccer ball that, that was your data center and your perimeter. And then you had physical control over it, and all of a sudden it's in the hands of other people and you don't have physical control over it. Not only do you not have physical control of it, you can't control what the people are doing. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you have to manage in a very, very different way. All the technology you've talked about up until now, none of it works in this, in this situation. I agree. You, I agree. You, 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 you can no longer control it in that way. And you know, some of the things that we have on this slide, uh, shadow IT. So you know, that's, that's a legend. Uh, every company has a VP of marketing 
and that VP of marketing has a credit card and, oh, we need this. Wouldn't it be great? And, <laughs> and they swipe the credit card, you know, virtually. Or Demi, as you said in our last webinar, actually, they didn't even pay. Uh, it's yeah, some kind it's of a freemium. freemium. Yeah, and so they're, they're, poking, they're poking their own hole in your soccer ball and hooking a <laughs> pipe in, and you don't even know about it. Uh, so yeah. that's a huge challenge. And now in the, I kind of like to call it the COVID cloud, that we, we, we really want to pass through <laughs> that cloud, but we're not. Uh, yes. The cloud is staying. It's not going anywhere. And who knows what other things, that are, other challenges that are similar to it that we're going to hit. And now all of a sudden, people like you and I are working from home. And it happened in a heartbeat. And very few people were prepared for it. Very few people had all the security set up to really make that work. Mm -hmm. And so all of a sudden you have a, a major challenge. And now I'm talking about your own people. Wait a second. We get all those other soccer balls that we have those pipes running to. Love the oh my God. Balls. They're all working from home too. Now you don't only have to worry about your own staff. You have to worry about the staffs of all those other companies and you don't have any control over it. Mm -hmm. And the fact of the matter is, you know, this is, I'm giving you kind of an emotional sounding gut feeling about what's happening out there. Um, but there are very, very solid surveys. Uh, you see here uh, data risk in the third party ecosystem. That's by a good friend of mine, Dr. Larry Poneman, very brilliant and a very nice guy who has an extremely rigorous methodology of checking out the market. And he did a survey I was involved in uh, for three years running in, in one of these surveys where every year more and more of the people surveyed said they experienced a data breach caused by a third party. A third party mm -hmm. was a vector for a data breach. And now mm -hmm. new element, which we haven't talked about up until now, but it's a big one for a lot of people. It's regulation. Um, I think you mm -hmm. mentioned GDPR, you mentioned CCPA. Yep. It's just the tip of the iceberg. There are regulations everywhere. If you're in the payments business, in Europe, PSD2, in the United States, uh, uh, you have uh, GLBA, uh, mm -hmm. and then you have industry standards like PCI you have to adhere to. All of these things, which by the way, so these are, I call them regulatory directives. Uh, mm -hmm. They're a lot like the control frameworks you referenced earlier, yep. NIST CSF and all the other NISTs and ESO, ISO, depending on where you're from, and COSO, COBIT, uh, the mm -hmm. CSA standard, all these. Well, regulations are really also a new set of standards. The difference is that NIST is, uh, NIST is uh, uh, voluntary yes. mm -hmm. and Free. these things are not voluntary. You have no choice but mm -hmm. to comply with all these regulations. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole new set of problems and all of the good ones, all of these regulations, everyone I've ever read talks about, you have to understand what's going on with your third parties and you are responsible for the security and privacy of those third parties. Mm -hmm. And so you, you don't have a choice. You have to do this. Yep. So go to go to the next slide. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, now we've been talking about, we, we talked about that breach a little while ago, P and I data, P, uh, P and I media, P and I in fact uh, is an outsourcer of photo processing. Mm -hmm. So it, I, I used to live in the United States, two blocks away from me, there was a CVS pharmacy and I used to send them my pictures all the time and they would print them. It's a great selfies? service. And selfies and everything else, you know, <laughs> pictures of the kids, the dog, you name it. But um, it, it didn't occur to me, even though I've been in the third party space for 10 years, CVS doesn't do any of that. It's all outsourced to mm -hmm. P&I Media. So I gave them my credit card. I gave them my personal information. I gave them pictures. Who knows what personal data I gave them. And all of that was now in P&I Media's hands. And I don't know what happened when the breach occurred. I don't really know. So there's a lot of dynamics here that hit each of us personally. Now, what we're talking about here with an outsourcer like that, that's a headline, critical relationship yep. for a lot of companies. But if that's all you're checking out, you're really only covering part of the risk. So if you're like, let's just take an example that I know because I've been working with a lot of banks, 50% uh, of the stuff I've been doing for the last, let's say five, six years has been with banks of all sizes from 
from you know the biggest global banks down to very large mid-sized banks in the United States uh, and in the UK and in other countries. And every one of those banks has not one, not two, not 10. They may have 50 law firms, 100 law mm -hmm. firms. Law firms for everything, this, for, for anything for else. Everything. Just picture the law firm is now one of those, those, those soccer balls floating in cyberspace, and you just connected them to you, and you can just ask them a simple question. If you want to know whether or not they're at a risk, you 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 ask them, where do you store the documents that I give you that have all the personal information yeah. of my customers and all kinds of other intellectual property and very sensitive stuff. Where do you store that? And you're going to go get on the phone with a very any size law firm today, almost any in the world. Where do you store all that stuff? They're going to say, oh, we have this great new cloud-based document management system. Well, guess what? They're cloud, just like your big critical outsourcers. They're out in the cloud too. Uh, payroll services, it's obviously cloud. Mm -hmm. You are outsourcing something where you are passing very, very uh, sensitive information and you may not be thinking about it. And so mm -hmm. the, the message here is this concept of managing third parties, looking at them from a cybersecurity and privacy perspective, it's a big universe. It's lots of those soccer balls floating around your sun, lots of those planets floating around your sun with all kinds of pipes. And some of those pipes have holes in them. And so you have to look at the entire, uh, not just vendors, but your partners of all kinds, your agents, uh, intermediaries, all these relationships. You got to look at all of them. You got to think of them as being part of your attack service. Mm -hmm. You have to manage them. But again, how do you manage them? You can't put technology out there in the traditional sense. You can't scan inside and enumerate all their assets and you can't, you know, have fire. It's up to them. It's not up You're to not you. allowed to do that inside. You're not I mean, allowed to. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Sure. So at least like to sum things up in the context of the risk on the company itself, and I would call that the corporate or the enterprise level uh, risk or security. Uh, we spoke a lot about like threat modeling, okay? It's great, but as we mentioned, it's not enough. You try, need to try to identify that continuously. And it's not a one-off, you know? You don't, you don't just say, that's it, like right now I didn't have security, I invested X, and right now, wow, I have security. It just doesn't work that way, okay? Developers should be threat modeling also, not only the security people. And when I say developers, it can be any stakeholder, any business entity in the organization. Always prioritize your data and business value and what are you actually trying to protect? Because right now you need to at least understand the landscape of where your data is distributed at and then try to identify what's important. Make it quick, make it lightweight, okay? You don't have to solve all the problems in the world and make it agile because everything will be changing and you need to adapt to that. Security is a process, like we've mentioned, nothing is a one-off, not, not a one-off solution at least. And you need to do that on a periodic basis, okay? On some, some kind of cadence. It can be uh, annual, it can be quarterly, it can be even daily according to the amount of risk and according to the importance of that specific asset that you're trying to protect. And of course, like, like everything, always challenge yourself okay? and, and your software and all of the pieces that you're exposing digitally. And we spoke a lot in the context of, you know, like internal entities that we're trying to at least communicate with, what happens if uh, some kind of employee's account get breached or something in that context. Uh, but eventually you need to understand at least other stakeholders that might be relevant when you're actually looking on this like whole flow, right? Because for example, we have the internal business owner that owns the, the business function of what we're trying to achieve right now. This is one stakeholder. We have us, okay? I, I like to categorize us as a, as a, as a whole. Uh, the security team, the legal team, the data privacy team sometimes. It really depends who actually holds the process itself. And we have the supplier, the third party, 
okay, the other entity that actually holds some subset of my data or it, even sometimes all of my data. Because today, even like you've mentioned, uh, emailing services, cloud service providers, you literally ditched your data center. You don't have any security controls that uh, like are physical. I don't need to protect my physical data center, et cetera. And the only thing that I have is basically a cloud service provider that holds my emails and a cloud service provider that holds all of my data and storage. Awesome, right? And eventually all of the pillars actually communicate with each other. Like for example, opening up a new supplier, then us as the security team, we need to kind of like transmit to the supplier side, to the third party, something technical, right? You know, like SQL injection, et cetera, blah, 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 blah. Who says that he actually understands anything because it might be a business entity and not somebody from the world of security or technology. And then you need to communicate the, the things back to the not technological person on the other end, because these are the security gaps that prevent him doing business. Fun, Do right? you actually tell them dollar sign, pound sign, at sign? Don't you? Uh, 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 exclamation marks, SQL injection? <laughs> uh, that, that's how I talk with my mother. I'm SMSs. sure your mother understands exactly what you're talking about. That's a blunt lie. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we kind of need to identify also what's the impact. Okay. Because right now we spoke about a process, but how it affects my company when I have this kind of process. Okay. So uh, traditional uh, cybersecurity models, like what do you know today in the market, in the industry though? It's the universal solution is a questionnaire people mm -hmm. send questionnaires out to their to their partners their vendors uh their their you know everybody who they're working with uh the questionnaires can be short they can be very very long i've i've actually answered questionnaires that were over a thousand questions fun uh, with sig core which say fun with sig core uh, actually, that was full SIG. I actually once entered a full SIG back when SIG was quite a bit bigger than it is today. <laughs> uh, it was something like 2,000 questions, but they had, give, they, they, they had given me a pass, and I only answered 1,000 or 1,200 questions. Such that was nice not people. Fun. Right. But this is, is, is a, a problematic approach. So the other approach that, that people are doing today is they are using scanning services. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to go to the next slide there. No, sorry. I just uh, we missed we missed one, right. And um, yep, there we go. OK, so um, people are using security rating services. They are using tools that will scan the outside of a company. So back to my you know, planet or soccer ball um, metaphor, it's, it's like you found the soccer ball. By the way, you have to find the soccer balls. Uh, and then you're, you're running your fingers over the outside to find the grooves and the holes and the places where there's, you know, there's, there's the, the surface rubbed off and the air is coming out. Uh, but the fact of the matter is that the, the scanning, it's powerful, but it's like an iceberg. And you're only getting the tip of the iceberg. You don't actually know what's going on mm -hmm. under the surface of those apparently calm waters, maybe some turbulence. Yep, indeed. So, so okay. probably, I'm guessing, again, hint, there must be a better way. Uh, but again, what's the problem with all of the traditional methods? Okay. So going back to what's, it, what's the most common traditional method, everybody who's, who's concerned about this but has yet to build beyond that is sending out questionnaires. Usually they're doing them as Excel spreadsheets or some people who are particularly masochistic are sending them out as <laughs> Word documents. I know, Demi, you that's have answered That's not fun. Yes, stuff. yes, that's no, not fun. No, no, not fun. Excel isn't fun, but, but Word is worse. Um, and those questionnaires are, are not contextual. They, they don't respond to the actual dynamics of the relationship. Uh, most people who are doing this. They, they don't have time to do much more than, all right, we've got a questionnaire. Either they, they bought one or they found one on the internet or they made their own and they're sending it out. And, and maybe it's a long questionnaire uh, and there are pieces of it that are not relevant to every relationship. Mm -hmm. um, now that's, on, that's, that's, um, that's what I'm sending out, but then it comes back and I have to review it. And I'm sorry for uh, you, by the way, that you have to right. review that. Because <laughs> that is actually 
more painful than answering the question or reviewing the questionnaire is very, yeah. very hard. And you're scratching your head, trying to figure out, they said yes to this, but no to that. What, how does that work? And then they said yes to this, but I don't really know if it's really yes. Like, is, if they want to sell me something. Is that a real yes? Can you, can you back that up with some evidence? And maybe they didn't, you know, or you didn't think to ask for documents. There's a lot of complexity to this problem. Mm -hmm. um, and it takes a lot of time. And very, very few people have enough people and time to actually keep after this, where they're using this, this kind of methodology. And everybody is adding new cloud-based services and new vendors all the time. Your business people are after you. They're saying, uh, please approve this, make sure it's okay. And you're um, hmm, I better check it out. We figure out what they do. Let me send them a questionnaire. And then you bug them, bug them, bug them, bug them, bug them. And then about a month later, you get the answers. Maybe they didn't fill out the whole thing. Mm -hmm. All right, great. You got it back and you review it. The fact of the matter is that if they told you the honest to God truth, it's only the truth the minute you get the questionnaire exactly. back, hopefully. Unless they filled it out three months ago and it's some kind of standard questionnaire. But it doesn't tell you very much about what happens day 30, day 60, day 90. And as Demi said earlier, um, the, one of the most important ways that you can defend yourself against uh, a, a hacking, updating. If you're not updating, you're not defending yourself. Well, you're updating. <laughs> you're adding new servers. You're, you're changing the software. We don't know what's going on. We sent you a questionnaire six months ago. We have no idea. Or they had a problem when we got the questionnaire back. There's something we don't like. There's something that we are concerned about. What do you do? How do you keep after that one problem? Let's just assume you that really issue. read the questionnaire. You made an issue out of it. Mm -hmm. What do you do with that? I don't know. <laughs> Nothing. Most of the times, I'm just kidding. Most of the time, people who do this, who are you know at the beginning of this this journey, and this is definitely a journey, uh, and it's not an easy one. You're really climbing a mountain, kind of like the image of Sisyphus, that image pushing a rock up a mountain and never really getting there. Um, but let's turn the tables here. Let's look at it from the other side. So we were inside of our soccer ball. We're going over the pipe. We're going to their soccer ball. How do they conceive of it? What do they feel like uh, when they're looking at what you just sent them? You just sent them a questionnaire or you're scanning them or something like that. So, Tammy, you want to go to the next slide? Yes, yeah, sure. Sorry. So, <laughs> keep going. How, how, how does it actually see that? There we go. Okay. Well, <laughs> what's it like? The dog ate my questionnaire. All right. Presumably that doesn't happen very often, um, but the questionnaire was too long, happens all the time. The questionnaire has nothing to do with my business. Uh, I developed software for you. You sent me a questionnaire about cloud security. I don't run cloud for you. I don't even run a cloud-based app. I'm developing all, yeah. software that you're putting on your cloud infrastructure. You, you sent me something that's irrelevant. I, I can't even answer it. Or very, very common, uh, you have a main contact at the company that you're thinking about hiring. It's a sales contact. Now, first of all, are they the right person to answer the question? Probably no. Or probably <laughs> no. What will they do? They're going to answer yes to everything. They want to sell you something. Of course. So now let's go over to the issues of the scanning, of that image of the of the iceberg. Um, no, we keep it going back. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, sorry. Excuse That's me. That's okay. So um, you're telling them uh, that your scanning solution identified a problem with their MX record uh, or with an untrusted certificate uh, or there's a version of software that's out of date or something like that. And they say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know what you're seeing. Or maybe it's a little bit more evolved where you're giving them some additional information about where you see an old version of software. And they're going to say, well, that's not my asset. That's a redirect uh, or, you know, something else like that. Um, and back to something we said earlier, uh, you found a problem. Uh, you, 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 you don't like uh, the way that they're 
MX record is set up. There, there's something missing mm -hmm. here. Um, and that's this is very, very common. We see this all the time. Yep. What do you do? Uh, I, or I, I just don't believe it. I'm sorry. You know, we have airtight security. I, I check with my CISO. That's not a problem. Show me the details. Or something that you do see occasionally. If you're going to put me through this incredibly painful process, I'm not going to do business with you. It's just not worth it. And I've actually heard of vendors saying, I'm happy to answer your questionnaire or to review your, your, your cybersecurity posture report for $5,000. <laughs> that's real yeah. that's actually i know i know so keep on going here so today you've got to move beyond both of these approaches uh you you can't do just manual questionnaires you can't use uh, security rating services which are essentially data feeds uh and they're good data feeds questionnaires have value but uh, if you're using either of them you are not really going to be successful. You're going to be fighting an uphill battle and uh, you're not gonna get the information you need. And, and most important, you're not gonna get to the end of the story um, with, with your vendors. So let's keep going, Demi. Mm -hmm. So now we're talking about context here. The portfolio of vendors that you have, they're not all the same. They don't all pose the same level of risk or the same kinds of risk. Going back to my example earlier, mm -hmm. a company that does software development for you, you must be concerned about their secure development lifecycle, the secure development practices. Uh, you have to know whether they have a separation of duties and how they deploy versions. Um, you, you have to know very, very different things about your cloud providers or somebody who um, is selling you a web-based application. There's all, all different things going on there. Or maybe you're passing a data feed to somebody who's processing it for you. All of these people, all these vendors pose different risks. You must know what they're doing for you. Um, and again, they don't all access the same information. Um, it's just two very, very extreme examples. Um, this may sound silly, but the people who uh, empty the garbage every day in your facility, um, they have, they're, they're, they're posing some risk to you. You wanna know who their employees are. You wanna know how they do background checks. You wanna know if they prevent their employees from bringing cell phones into your company because they can take pictures. Uh, or what are they gonna do with that That's pretty radical if you have that, by the way. It, it it is not, a, yeah. not every industry actually needs that, or that, that, that type of protection, I mean. But it's real because I know, they, I know. Of course, they're like the spies. I mean, that is the simplest form of spying. There's all kinds of weird things going on out there. I heard yep. this is real. I, I could not have made this up. This came from one of the five largest banks in the United States. A good friend of mine, responsible for certain kinds of security. Uh, they were breached because they had an aquarium that was <laughs> on their Wi-Fi. The aquarium was controlled. You know, this is the same example that a lot yesterday showed uh, in a casino, okay? Specifically talking about a digital aquarium <laughs> that through that, the, the attackers uh, could get access to the uh, corporate company details. And I know this is not an urban legend because my friend told no, me this not. actually happened to them. Yeah, I know. Um, so let, let's go up a level here. Demi showed you a slide earlier he, he titled it three pillars. It's the stakeholders in this process. And there's a very important stakeholder in this process. This is the, 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 the business sponsor of a relationship. Um, you know, an executive comes to IT and says, I'd like to buy Salesforce or some other CRM or Workday or any one of thousands of different SaaS based applications they do not understand the third party risk. Our example earlier of the VP of marketing who, who brings on some kind of a freemium service isn't paying for it. Yeah. They don't understand the risk. They don't understand the concept of this risk. And your company is not gonna have the same risk appetite as everybody else. So what we're saying here is that you have to put this whole thing into context. You have to have 
um, a context that is shared with all of those three pillars that we showed before, the business owner, the relationship owner, the business yep. sponsor, whatever term you want. It's the person who wants to hire the vendor, um, the IT risk person who's doing all this work, person who's standing in the middle, maybe that's some of us on this call today. Uh, and then we have the vendor. We, we wanna be on the same page. And so the context has to be the same. And part of what that does for you is it makes possible a common language. If you're all talking about the same set of risks, at least now you can talk about them. If you have the terminology, you pick a framework like NIST CSF, or I'm a big fan of NIST privacy framework mm -hmm. um, because it establishes a common language for privacy. Uh, so this is even more important when it comes to third parties than, become, than it comes to your internal systems because now you gotta communicate with somebody who's gonna hire the third party and you gotta communicate with the third party. And so this is very, very crucial that you put that context into the whole picture. Totally. So again, like we mentioned, the three pillars, uh, wouldn't it be easier if you'll be able to actually streamline that whole process, open a supplier, create some kind of remediation plan, the third party will actually fix all of the possible security gaps that are introduced. You want to explain the risk factors to the business owner if you'd like try to identify and maybe even accept the risk. And that's it, everything just happened. But for that, we actually need to create something, okay? We need to create a program. And even like maybe you have a program in place and you need to identify the new types of risk that are introduced to your business and you need to refine your program. How we might actually do that, Dov? So let's start from the absolute beginning here. Before you start doing this, managing third party information security and privacy, you have to work out the landscape within your company. Let's say you are the IT risk person who's responsible for this process. There are other people who are in the picture. There's the business owner, as I said earlier, undoubtedly legal is in the picture. You're negotiating a contract with somebody or you're potentially negotiating a contract, you've done an RFP. Um, and so they're involved. Um, and by the way, they're also gonna be involved when it comes to regulation because they may be the carriers of that regulation, the, the compliance within your organization. Procurement, because well, none of this happens without procurement. procurement. And maybe you're the security SME or maybe somebody else is gonna be security SME. So you gotta know who's involved. The next thing you're gonna do is you're going to tier yep. those third parties. You're going to break them up into groups that reflect different levels of risk for your business, different levels of criticality for your business. Criticality mm -hmm. is, is how long can you do without them? If you can't do without them for even a minute, like we said earlier with PNI Media. Or even like, can down. you substitute them or not? Right something called uh, vendor lock-in risk, some people call that. Mm -hmm. uh, so you, you've got to break your, your portfolio of relationships into tiers, and some people call that segmentation, and then you're going to define a security policy for each tier. What do I need at that level of security? You're, you're, you're exposing your business at level five. I need level five security, level four. What? Level four security. I'm being very simplistic about it, but if somebody is only level one, is really very little exposure, I don't need a lot of security. So yeah. I have a different policy. And then for each of those tiers, now I've been calling it this for years, a standard of care. There's a methodology for doing a review for each of those tiers. There is a, a some kind of a standard for how frequently you're gonna come back to review them again, because you don't mm -hmm. know, things change. The recertification process. Recertification, or some people call it uh, a cadence of rinse and repeat. Yes. Um, and then if you're using a continuous monitoring feed, a security rating service, you don't want to look at all of the alerts you get with the same thresholds. Somebody who's at level five in terms of criticality or risk, five point change in their score, you're paying attention. Somebody's at level one, you may not care if they have a hundred point change in score and you have to break it up that way because you're getting too much information from continuous monitoring. Yep. You have to have some predefined process Policy. for mm -hmm. what to do with alerts that you get out of an, a security rating service. 
who gets them? What do you do with them? You have to have some kind of a procedure. Uh, do we have a review with the vendor? Uh, well, maybe not always. Maybe if it's a small drop or a minor issue, it has nothing to do with the business. We, we may just pass the information on to them and, and note it. But if it's directly related to what we're doing with them, what do we do? We have to have some kind of a, of a discussion with the, the business owner, the, the, the sponsor mm -hmm. of the relationship and with the vendor. And then we have to have some kind of a predefined expectations of vendor response. Yep. Now, there are always going to be in every portfolio, you're going to have the, the third parties that don't adhere to your policy. And in some cases, you may have a good business reason to work with them. They may have a unique advantage yeah. that you would like business to bring advantage. into your business. Yeah. And so what do you do? And sometimes you're going to remediate. You're going to try to have them fix the problem. And in many cases, they'll be willing to because they want to present the best face to the world. Uh, they want to have the best cybersecurity. It's good for business. Um, and sometimes they can't because they just aren't that sophisticated. And in those cases, you're going to implement compensating controls. Yep. Uh, so the, the, the classic example of that, if any of you remember, is the 2013 target breach in the United States, which was uh, the mother of all third-party breaches. <laughs> it's a great example of a lot of stupidity and a lot of mistakes that could have, preve could have pre been, pre been prevented easily. It could have been what's, what's called in many cases a kill chain. Uh, so in that, in that situation, you had a provider, what did they do? Um, Fazio Brothers, they yeah. were a provider of air conditioning. Air data. conditioning, yeah. Mm -hmm. Incredible. There's nothing to do with data. They're not outsourcing anything critical to you, except if your air conditioner's down, people may not come into your store. Yeah, but what about credentials? Well, so that's the issue here. So the way that breach happened, two mistakes, uh, three mistakes, really. <laughs> um, Fazio Brothers wasn't careful enough about their passwords. Um, and uh, Target made a stupid mistake a couple of weeks before the breach happened. They connected their point of sale network to their operational network so that you know, once those two were bridged, anybody who got the operational network could get credit card data mm -hmm. uh, that came out of their cash register, or, you know, their, their, their terminals. So uh, when you had Fazio Brothers submitting an invoice via accounts payable in Target's data systems, so they were allowed in, some hacker got in that way. So you had a, a cascade of problems that should have had a kill chain. Uh, Fazio Brothers should have had a better control over their password. Okay, we're going to assume they're just not sophisticated enough. They're in the HVAC business. They, they fix air conditioners. They don't understand this stuff. Mm -hmm. So what do you do as, as, as target? Well, you define some kind of a complex password policy. You force them to change the passwords every 75 days. All right, those are controls that you have to put on them. But there's a simple control you put on yourselves. Uh, and we talked about it earlier. All the control frameworks have it principle of least privileged access. Just don't let them get to anything other than what they have to get to, VLANs and, and other access control mechanisms that you do internally. Don't rely on them. The last resort, can't fix this relationship. Find somebody else. Fire the vendor. Don't hire them. Lots of ways you can fix this. Yep. So now let's just say that go to the next slide here, that you have built a cutting edge program. Mm -hmm. You are using um, the best questionnaire. You are using a really nice web-based tool to deliver it and pull it back and score it and all that great stuff. And you have a, 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 a security rating service delivering to you a very, very complete data feed. And you've thought all these things through that we're talking about. So you still have a scale problem. Because all these things still rely on somebody to review what comes through. The cutting edge thinking that I think you're going to see in more and more places is to really consume and act on all the intelligence you can get. Uh, you, you, you got a questionnaire, you scan them, you, you're now continuously scanning them. 
you're detecting who their fourth parties are. That's something very important. You need to know who they subcontract, it's not their fourth parties, your fourth parties, but who they subcontract to. Uh, and there's business intelligence. You find out things about them. Maybe they have a financial problem uh, or you just get a word of a breach um, or you have internal information from other people, business managers who are saying, you know what, they're starting to deliver slower. They're not meeting their SLAs with us. You want to mm -hmm. capture as much as you can and correlate it as much as you can and think about what you're going to do when you come back and you issue them <laughs> another questionnaire and you do a review. So um, let's just say that uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to kind of break away from the, 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 the slide a little bit, but but let's just say that you're doing business with somebody and I'm going to give a positive, not a negative example mm -hmm. where you're scanning them and you're watching and you see they patch fast, constantly updating. Do you really have to send them a questionnaire next year about patching? Maybe not. Maybe so, not. You, you yeah, want you, to decide, you know, you want to decide, right. The, the point is to is to act on the intelligence you have, and, and this is not easy, and, and I think you're going to see this evolving over time, but the point is you have resources, uh, use them intelligently, and bring that data together and analyze everything you have together so that you're spending less time actually doing things you don't need to do. That's really what it is. Again, this is a risk-based approach. Adopt the risk-based approach figure out where the risk is and focus on it. And don't focus equally on everything. So this is context on steroids. Demi, should we yep. move on? Yep, indeed. So in general, when, when we're speaking about the whole process right now that we've kind of created, okay, mentally even, <laughs> even if you don't have that implemented uh, on, on regular basis, uh, you need to understand of a risk-based approach that needs to incorporate everything with some kind of context. Even if I'm talking about the enterprise risk part of it that we initiated with the first uh, part of the talk uh, in which we kind of described all of the things that we're trying to protect and uh, getting the external exposure because we're talking about the digital exposure. We need to do the same thing about the aggregates, okay? All of the other entities that I'm communicating with, like you've mentioned in the context of third-party risk. But eventually it ends up of some specific framework, okay? I would call that some kind of like continuous monitoring framework that you need to create. And not only automating the third-party security lifecycle management, automating the whole lifecycle management of your security exposure. So you need to understand, like you've mentioned lots of, uh, I would say pieces of the puzzle. Okay, one of them would be the outside in approach. Okay, understanding the uh, hacker view, uh, understanding the external attack surface of the organization and continuously monitoring and rediscovering that and doing the whole reconnaissance phase that we've described in the beginning on a continuous manner, on a certain cadence. It can be daily, it can be weekly, monthly, whatever you feel comfortable with of actually like, you know, like doing that. And at least like absorbing the data also is sometimes overwhelming. You, you always describe the fire hose of information and, and it's true. Okay. You have endless amount of information, but this is not enough. Like even understanding things from the outside, you need to understand a lot of internal things, internal things that we've kind of talked about it with implementing with the questionnaire method and creating some kind of control framework method that we want to adhere to. But not only that, it might be even like pen testing or on-site audits. A lot of things that I can understand on the internal security posture of the organization that kind of like, um, I would say it's the complementary from the inside to try to understand how the overall cybersecurity posture is. Okay, so in general. But again, like we've described, this is not enough because you have the context. And what we, once we've actually like analyzed that and engaged with the vendor itself and with the internal entities, sometimes it's other departments in the organization, then you need to create some kind of remediation plan. And we spoke about the risk. So the, the combination of the outside in and the inside out with the contextual part of it, of what you call always the inherent risk that yielded the, the real risk out of the, the relationship that I have, it might be internal or external, then I need to have a decision. Like you said, I might actually approve that or reject, or maybe even contingent to approve that. 
and eventually end up with some kind of decision-making process to maybe accept or reject the risks. And of course, like you said, that like the rinse and repeat and all the context of the continuous thing, but you need to create some kind of monitoring framework to be able to identify new risks that are exposed or even like risks that are, are not valid anymore, right? Because again, we said everything is super dynamic. Everything is changing in the world. And if you are able to actually identify that, you will be able to do a really efficient and effective even, not only efficient uh, manner of uh, improving your security posture continuously. I hope it makes sense. Cool. Uh, this is kind of like a, a summary of uh, all of the things that we spoke about because we initiated with uh, explaining at least the internal enterprise risk. And it, okay, I won't call that internal enterprise risk period because uh, it incorporates a lot of things. It may be even like uh, uh, other departments inside the organization globally. And it's kind of like not really inside because we're using a lot of services. And because of that fact, we kind of like expanded the whole attack surface, our own data center, uh, like uh, traditionally what we thought to the external parameter and understanding also the exposure by our third parties, which is super important because right now the third parties are part of us, okay? And if I'm not using one emailing tool, I will be using the other. If I'm not using, not using two cloud service providers, I might be using four. And when I'm saying cloud service provider, it can be even our Salesforce, okay? For example, uh, as uh, doing a CRM, because this is also cloud, right? Somebody else's cloud, somebody else's server. So eventually you need to at least understand your exposure uh, or if we start from the beginning in the context of data, what you're trying to protect, what type of data assets, because right now they are the key components, the IPs of the company, then understand where they resided at, if it's on my premise on, or on the third party's premise or both. And then eventually trying to understand continuously this overchanging landscape of our external uh, attack surface and exposure. And eventually we end up with a really complex system. We need to put some kind of framework or at least control framework in place uh, to try to maybe uh, monitor that and try to understand and get visibility on that blind spot currently that was created in the overchanging world today. So eventually we ended up with implementing an, uh, something, again, some kind of program. I really hope that we kind of given you the uh, practical tools to actually do that with the right questions to ask internally in your organization and even other stakeholders that might be external to your organization. And uh, after like talking for an hour and a half, really, really fast and ping ponging between us, I'm really <laughs> sure that probably your faces are like this. Uh, and even if you didn't like ask questions during, really feel free to raise your hand virtually <laughs> or unmute yourself, which is the new way of doing that and uh, asking. Thank you so much. All right, so any questions, guys? Anybody here have questions? Guys uh, or gals? Cows and guys. <laughs> okay, so anybody awesome. has questions in here? So if there are no questions and people are shy, then really feel free to contact both me or Dove uh, via social media, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, mail pigeons, whatever works. Uh, we have our email smoke addresses. Signals. I like smoke signals. Yeah? Yeah. But, but yeah. It, you know, the ozone layer and things, it's problematic. All right, <laughs> steam, steam signals. Steam signals, steam signals. Okay, cool. So uh, really, if we can help with anything, just let us know uh, some guidance or some even like connection to other types of uh, people that have implemented that, that these things all will work uh, and uh, enjoy the conference. Thank you very much for hosting Galona and all of the other guys on OWASP. This is awesome. No worries. Thank you so much, um, Demi and Dov. Uh, guys, if you want you. to um, check on uh, our channel you can also collaborate in there you, you if you're not a member of our slack channel just check on the invitation in the chat messages and you can click on that and join I always ask slack and then if you want to um go over our site and check on the recordings uh please visit um www www.opensecuritysummit.org. Okay, and so you can, you can see also, that on the channel. 
yes you can also see it on youtube you have all of yes. the all of the talks and it's super fast uploaded <laughs> i must say yes <laughs> you can also check our youtube channel the link is uh in the chat okay all right God. all right so thank you so much for your time i'm going to uh, um end the recording so if if people are shy then you can um ask questions after the recording is off <laughs> cool thank you <laughs>